Hey, Walter Sorrels back with another Knife Makers Friday 5. Today we're talking Japanese swords. I got a note this week from a viewer who's interested in making a Japanese sword. I guess it's going to be his first time taking on the challenge. And he wanted to know about some of the critical dimensions for making a Japanese sword. He was, uh, you know, having difficulty finding sort of here the standard dimensions for length and width and all that sort of thing. So uh, before I get to that, what kind of struck me was that a lot of us think early on in our knife making career that we're going to make a Japanese sword. In fact, that's where I started. And I took on the challenge of making a Japanese sword and quickly realized, like, I just don't come anywhere close to knowing enough to do the uh, justice to this job. So I thought that, you know, before sort of getting into some of the nitty gritty of these dimensions for a Japanese sword, I'd talk a little bit about some preliminaries if you've never made a Japanese sword before and you're kind of thinking about doing it. So let me mention a few things about attempting Japanese swords. Now look, I would never discourage anybody from taking on the challenge of making a Japanese sword. That's kind of the whole point of this video, but you got to bear in mind that the katana is rightly considered to be one of the great challenges that any bladesmith can take on. There's a reason that it's considered that, and it's because it's difficult. So if you think that you're going to make a katana as your very first blade, and it's going to turn out to be perfect, uh, well, not going to happen. You know, I like I said, I tried that, and I realized real quickly that I just didn't know what I was doing, and I needed to back up and do some kind of preliminary stuff before I really got started. So the first thing I'd strongly recommend is to do research, do your homework. You know, be prepared to do a lot of research, in fact, to get the details right. You know, when I got started, um, you know, two decades ago, I was a pretty experienced Japanese martial artist. I'd trained with Japanese swords, and I really thought I had a pretty good functional understanding of how Japanese swords work. I really didn't. Once you get down to the details of actually executing the sword, a lot of little picky details to get right. Um, so even if you're, you know, an experienced bladesmith, first katana is going to be a big undertaking and there's a lot of stuff that you need to figure out in order to execute it properly. One of the first things that anybody who's interested in Japanese swords will tell you is that the more swords that you see in the flesh, the better off you are. Now, the problem with Japanese swords is they're very expensive. Uh, it's just not easy to come across really finely made examples of the Japanese sword making craft uh, unless you got tons and tons of money to throw at the problem. So um, that said, a lot of books and places online that you can go to get interesting information. Uh, one place that I would recommend right off the bat, uh, there's a Japanese uh, sword um, store in, uh, in Tokyo called Aoi Art um, or Aoi Art Auctions. I forget exactly what their name is. Anyway, I'll provide a link here. They sell a lot of swords and all of their swords have very nice pictures, uh, lots of details in terms of the size and you know shape of them and so forth. So if you just want to look at a lot of instances with uh, details about uh, the size of things, great place to start. Another really important uh, resource is a book called The Craft of the Japanese Sword by Yoshindo Yoshihara and Leon Kapp and uh, I forget his wife's name, but anyway, three authors, but Yoshindo Yoshihara is the, is the Japanese smith. Um, and uh, fantastic book, couldn't recommend it too highly. Uh, anybody who's interested in Japanese swords ought to own that book. Um, another place, if you're interested in, in getting started, I would be remiss in uh, not mentioning my own stuff. I've got uh, a series of videos that you can find on waltersorrelsblades.com. Uh, and I've also got a playlist of Japanese sword-related videos on YouTube. Totally different sets. The ones on my uh, website are just kind of a comprehensive... Uh, set of videos about actually making swords. Uh, the ones on YouTube are just kind of here and there, lots of little interesting topics that, uh, you know, were of interest to me. Okay, so going beyond the preliminaries, one other thing to note is that, you know, the actual steel itself is a really, really important part of the making of Japanese swords. I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, most people, the first time around, you know, there's just no way they can take on the steel making aspect of making a Japanese sword. Put that aside, 
If you're interested in making a functional blade, it's entirely possible to use modern steel, uh, high carbon steel that you can get fairly readily uh, on the internet uh, to make a functional equivalent of a Japanese sword. Aesthetically, it's not going to be the same, uh, but you can make a sword that in terms of its function is absolutely the equal of historical um, Japanese swords. All right, so I'm starting to close in on the actual question that my viewer sent, which is to talk about the dimensions of Japanese swords. One thing to bear in mind is that, you know, the, the size of a Japanese sword is related to the physical stature and, you know, physical attributes and possibly the martial arts style and so forth, the background of the person who's actually using the sword. Anyway, so bottom line is there really are just not any set in stone dimensions for Japanese swords. Uh, that said, you know, this is just a, a, a kind of rule of thumb just for the general length of a Japanese sword um, that we used to use in martial arts practice. Uh, you just take the sword in your hand and you can just do this with a stick if you want to and just hold that down at your side, let it fall naturally and the distance between this part of your hand and the, uh, the ground is the distance that your sword would naturally fall. That's a good kind of reference point for the, the length of the sword. Bear in mind that you have to add about an inch for the habaki, which is the little copper collar that uh, goes around the, um, the joint between the tang and the blade. So really, for the total length of the blade, um, you know, in terms of how it fits your hand, uh, you're going to take the length of the blade plus that one inch, which constitutes the uh, rough uh, dimension of the habaki. One last sort of general point, uh, the Japanese blade tapers in all dimensions. In other words, from the spine, the thickness, the width, all of that tapers down as you go towards the point. Um, so you can't just maintain one dimension all the way down the blade like you would a modern stock removal knife. The thickness is going to change um, and the width is going to change. So curvature is known as sori, sori, S-O-R-I, and uh, typically that's around, you know, roughly three quarters of an inch to one inch, say two to two and a half, maybe three uh, centimeters. Um, but sori is also expressed in terms of where the center of the curvature lies. This is a really subtle point, and you have to know how to pre-curve the blade in order to sort of uh, make it curve properly. Uh, the, the blade will actually uh, produce about an inch of curvature, you know, a couple centimeters of curvature when it's quenched. So you have to sort of have a sense of exactly where that curvature is going to take place and how that's going to work if you're going to have your ultimate curvature lie in the right place. How do you get there? Unfortunately, it's just experience. It's something that you have to learn. But when you do this the first time, just be aware that blade is going to curve substantially when you quench it. <laughs>